If you'll find your place with me in your Bible at Matthew chapter 1, you say, what, Pastor, we're not in Luke chapter 1 and 2, chapters 1 and 2? Well, we're going to go back to there Thursday evening, and we'll go back there next Sunday, the Sunday after Christmas. Uh, but today, we're in Matthew chapter 1 to pick up one of the characters that's in the greatest story ever told. And I'm going to be talking to you today about that character in just a few minutes. I want to read to you beginning in verse 18 down through verse 25. So follow along with me. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, behold, they came together. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make, a, make, her, make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus." For he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till uh, she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we continue looking today at the greatest story ever told, the story of our Savior, of you, Lord Jesus, and especially the part of the story where it's about your coming to us from heaven to earth and just our amazement and the wonder that you would come to visit us and live amongst us and ultimately die and rise again for us. Father, today we consider one of the characters in this story, one of the supporting cast in this story, and I pray that you will help us to see this man maybe in a light that we haven't seen him before, and that we will appreciate the role that he played. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I read the story about a family that every year they would put out the crash, uh, the nativity scene. And for the most part, the parents would always take the various characters of the nativity scene and put them in their place. But their young children were beginning to get into elementary school years, and so they decided to see how much their children knew about the nativity scene. And so they simply set out the different pieces. They didn't put any of them in their place. And then they asked their children to identify the different characters and then to put them into that, uh, that crash, that nativity scene setting. Well, obviously, they quickly picked out the baby Jesus, and they were ready to put him in the right place. Then they picked out Mary, and they recognized her uh, easily. They picked out the shepherds. They could see the shepherd's staff, and so they knew those were the shepherds, and they put the animals out when they put the shepherds out, and then they chose the wise men. Obviously, the wise men weren't there at the birth of Christ. Uh, but in our manger scenes, we telescope those events and bring them all together. Uh, the wise men didn't come till up till two years later. Uh, but they knew the wise men because they had their gifts. They were bearing gifts, and they put the wise men in their place. And there was just one character left, and the kids couldn't figure out, where does he belong? Who is this character? Now, obviously, in your mind, you're already thinking who the character is, but you're not a child either. Some of you act like children on occasion, but you're not a child either. And these children were trying to think, who is this character? And they came to understand that character was, of course, Joseph. Probably the most underrated character in the greatest story ever told is the character of Joseph. We've looked at Zacharias and Elizabeth. Uh, we, we've talked about uh, John the Baptist. Uh, we've talked about these characters that are in this incredible story, but Probably the most underrated character in the story is the man Joseph. Did you know that of the, say, 15 or so times that his name is mentioned, 
And some of those 15 are mentioned in parallel passages. passages. In other words, the story in Matthew and the story in the Luke are the same story. And so you're reading the name. You see it twice in the text, but, I mean, it's really the same story. But if some 15 or so times that his name is mentioned, do you know that you never hear him speak a word? He never says anything except for one thing. Do you know what the one thing is? Well, don't, don't give it away if you know. We're going to find out here in the story as we talk about Joseph today and we think about this man who is so often overlooked. He's so often bypassed. He's sort of a prop in the story and we don't even realize the significance of this man and that what he, the, the part that he played, a, a, the supporting cast. He wouldn't even win an award for the best supporting actor if, if we were to give away awards because we hardly even know who he is or what he did. And yet, Matthew introduces us to him. He does so for a very specific purpose that we'll see before the message comes to an end. But introducing us to him, we learn things about him, not because he says something, but because of what we see the text telling us about this man. And I want to point out to you seven of the things that I find about this man that are fascinating. The first is that he's a godly man. You notice in the text that we read here a few minutes ago, how it speaks of him in verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. He's a godly man. He's a righteous man. It means exactly what you're thinking it means. He is a man who sought to do what was right. He is a man who sought to live in the right way. He is a man who honored God. He is a man who loved God. He was a man who was at the synagogue when he was supposed to be at the synagogue. He was at Jerusalem at the temple during the feast days when they were supposed to be at the temple at feast days. He closed down his carpentry shop on the Sabbath day. He didn't work on the Sabbath day. He didn't walk further than the law prescribed you could walk on the Sabbath day. He loved other people. He was considerate and kind to other people. He didn't use unjust means for collecting money, unjust balances, uh, unjust weights when it came to bartering and to buying things. This man who, who was called here just was a righteous man. He was a godly man. At, at the very core of his being was a depth of love that he had for God. And it's noted for us here that this is an exceptional characteristic about this man. He wasn't like the Pharisees who played the hypocrite, who said one thing and did another thing. This was a man who lived out his faith in a genuine way. This is a man who you're going to see hears from God. This is a man that is in tune with God and in touch with God because he's in a right relationship with God. Uh, Joseph wasn't perfectly righteous in the sense of sinless, but he was purposefully righteous. And he was right in his relationship with God. Purposefully righteous, I mean he got up every day seeking to live for God, seeking to obey God, seeking to do what God told him to do, seeking to follow God, seeking to honor God with his life. He was that kind of a man. And Matthew, in introducing us to this man Joseph in the story begins by telling us that this was a godly man. He wasn't only a godly man, he was a patient man. I don't know how he came to learn about the conception in Mary's womb, about Mary going to give birth to a child. It may have happened before uh, she went to be with Elizabeth, her near relative. You remember the angel speaks to Mary and says, there's a child that's conceived in your womb. We talk about the virgin birth. It's really a virgin conception. And she's told about the child, and she says, yes, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I am willing to be your vessel to bring this baby into the world. And she leaves to go be with Elizabeth. Did she tell Joseph before she left that she was pregnant. Did she tell Joseph before she left for that three months or so to be with Elizabeth that she was with child? Or was it three months later and she arrives back in the city of Nazareth and now she's showing her pregnancy? It's obvious that something is going on and you can imagine a conversation that might have taken place between the two of them. Joseph, 
I've got something to tell you. I've got to, I've got to let you in on something. I'm pregnant. And Joseph says, well, yeah, I, something was going on. It's obvious. I can tell what in the world has happened. And Mary says, it's not what you think, Joseph. It's not what you think. And Joseph says, well, it certainly looks like what I'm thinking. It certainly doesn't look right to me. And Mary begins to explain, well, I had an angel that appeared to me and said that there was a virgin conception, that the Holy Spirit would overshadow me and the miracle of this baby would be conceived within me. And Joseph is saying, what? What kind of a story are you telling, Mary? Why don't you just, why don't you just fess up and own up to the reality of what you've done? And maybe there's a discussion that goes back and forth. This had to, no doubt, be the lowest moment in the life of of Joseph he had ever experienced. He didn't hear the angel. He hasn't yet heard the angel himself. He didn't see the angel or hear the angel that spoke to Mary. All he knows is that she is showing that she is pregnant and she is telling him this fantastic story that it's hard to believe. I mean, if your daughter or your wife showed up and said, I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit, would you believe it? Would you even understand it? And he's wrestling in his mind, trying to understand. And I, I see a man here who, who is patient. Do you notice what it says about him? Verse 20, but while he thought about these things. You know, we rush to do things as quickly as possible. We rush to make decisions sometimes more quickly than we should. Uh, we pass judgment without thinking things through. Uh, we're always in a hurry. We're impetuous. We're, we're always... Uh, you know, quick to do things, and yet here was a man who is in a very difficult moment of his life. He doesn't understand what's taking place or what's happening. He can't reason it out in his mind. How could his uh, Mary be with child, and yet the two of them have never been together? What has she done? Why did she do this to me? Why am I in this mess? What am I going to do next? And what does he do? He patiently thinks things through. Wouldn't it be nice if we as Christians would stop and think before we act? Stop and think before we speak? Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, some of us just automatically say what's on our minds. Some of us wait too long to say what's on our minds. But somewhere in the middle of those two, there's a good balance. And here is a man who was patient. He's trying to figure out what in the world is going on, what in the world has happened. You know, God, I've got to know what's going on in this circumstance. You've got to help me. And I see a man who is patient. He had learned to wait before he made a rash decision. He wasn't only a godly man and a patient man, he, he was a gracious man. You, you notice again in verse 19, he says, the husband, Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Do you realize what Joseph could have done in this circumstance? Uh, take your Bible for a minute and turn back to Deuteronomy chapter, 20, uh, chapter 22 and just Follow along, verses 23 and 24, what he could have done in this situation. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 23. If a young woman who is a virgin is betrothed to a husband, that's Mary, that would be Mary in the New Testament story, and a man finds her in the city and lies with her, that would possibly what, be what Joseph was thinking had happened to Mary. Then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city, and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry out in the city, and the man, because he humbled his neighbor's wife, so you shall put away the evil from among you. It's hard for us to understand that in our society, sleeping together before marriage and sleeping together after you're married, sleeping with somebody else other than your spouse after your marriage are so common and we don't even view it as evil anymore. We don't even view it as sin. I shouldn't say we, that many people don't even view it as evil or sin anymore, that it's wrong. And yet that's not the way Joseph would have seen it. Joseph would have known well what the law said, and he could have taken her before the justices of that day and said, look, she's with child. I've not been with her. I'm not responsible for this child. Something has happened to her. Something has occurred to her. 
And they could have taken her outside the city gates and they could have taken the stones and they could have stoned her to death. Why? Because you purge evil from your midst. You don't want evil in the community of Israel. You purge it from your midst. When people know what is wrong and they do what is wrong anyway, you purge it from, their, from your midst. You don't hold on to it. You don't embrace it. You, you don't coddle it. You don't make excuse for it. You purge it. And Joseph could have said, I, I want her taken outside the city and I want, her, I want her killed. I want her stoned to death. But he didn't do that. He was a gracious man. He didn't want that to happen to Mary. Deep down in his heart, there was a love that he had for her. He was looking forward to the day that they, the two of them would be joined together as husband and wife. But now all of that seems to be broken and all of that seems to be ruined and all of that seems to be gone. And rather than have her taken out and stoned to death, which he would have had a right to do, he, he thinks in his heart, how can I do something that will be more gracious toward her? And what he decides to do is to put her away, to put her away privately, put her away secretly. In other words, to give her a bill of divorcement, because if you are in a betrothal you know, a, a agreement, if you're, in a, if you're betrothed to a man or a woman betrothed to a man, you're as good as married to him. You just have not come together to consummate that relationship yet. And to get out of that betrothal, it requires a divorce. And he decides not only to divorce her, but to do it secretly. To create as much, as little shame as possible. To avoid as much problem for her as is possible. She's already going to have difficulty. There's already going to be the eyes looking at her and the tongues wagging about her. There's already going to be the things that she has to deal with as a result. And he was thinking about Mary and in his graciousness he says, I don't want her to be stoned to death. I don't want her to have to deal with any more shame than she's already going to have to face. And he looks for a way to put her away quietly and graciously and mercifully. By the way, the law that is so strict and harsh as we think about it also enjoins upon people to be merciful. And here is a man obeying the law even in that respect, a just man obeying the law even in that respect, looking for a way to extend mercy, and he's looking to extend mercy to Mary. What in the world has happened? My dreams are shattered. My life is turned upside down. My plans, they're all gone. Everything I had hoped would be between the two of us is now gone, but I don't want her to be taken before the justices of the land and be stoned to death, and I don't want to make it any more difficult or shameful than it already is, and I'll just put her away privately. Well, after he decides to do that, that's when he stops to think, to ponder, to pray through what should be the right course of action and what happens. The angel comes and speaks to him, and the angel says, you don't have to be afraid, Joseph. You can take to yourself Mary to be your wife because what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. This isn't some illicit relationship. This isn't some immoral relationship. This is a miracle that is growing in her womb. And what she has told you about this miracle conception, this virgin conception, is in fact the case that what is growing in her is the work of the Almighty God because God is at work in the world to do something that brings salvation to all mankind. And suddenly all of that struggle and all of that pain and all of that hurt begins to melt away, and he begins to see a way through the fog. He begins to recognize that there is a purpose, and there is a meaning, and he understands that what's occurring is, in fact, what Mary said it is. This is the work of God within her. He is a gracious man. He's not only a godly man and a patient man and a gracious man. He's a compliant man. When he wakes up from that dream, do you notice in verse 24 what he does? Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, circle the next word, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. He did it. Wouldn't you expect a righteous man to do that? <laughs> Are you all here? Wouldn't you expect a just man to do that very thing? You would expect for him to obey God. 
If this is something that God has told him to do, you would expect for him to obey God. And what does he do? He obeys God. But if you want to see the compliance of, of Joseph again and again, just look a little later in chapter 2. Uh, you notice in verse 14 when he's told that he has to flee to Egypt. Verse 14, he arose and he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. And then if you look a little later in that chapter, in verse 21, after they spent a time in Egypt, God comes and says, it's time to come back to Israel. And what does he do? Verse 21, then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. And as he gets closer to the land of Israel, he recognizes that there's still danger that's present. And God comes to him and turns him into the city, moves him to the city of Nazareth. And what happens at the end of verse 22? He turned aside into the region of Galilee. You see a man who is compliant. When God says something, he does what God says. Isn't that amazing? In a world where we shake our fist in his face and we say, God, I want what I want the way I want it, when I want it. You don't tell me what I can want and what I can't want. Here is a man who's not only godly and patient and gracious, here's a man who knows what it means to be compliant. When God says something, he does it. He obeys God. He's not only a compliant man, he's a disciplined man. He's a disciplined man. You say, what do you mean by that? Joseph was a man of purity. He wasn't a man who was going to violate that purity with Mary. He was betrothed to her, and Matthew is quick to point out to us that this is a virgin conception. He makes it clear, but just notice it again, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed, why does Joseph tell us they're betrothed? Because that means they haven't come together at the marriage ceremony to consummate the relationship. And then it goes on to say, betrothed to Joseph. Notice the wording, before they came together. Didn't Luke do something very similar? Didn't Luke make it clear that this was a virgin birth? Amen. Amen. Luke made it clear this was a virgin conception. This was a virgin birth. But notice the self-control, verse 25. After he hears what the angel says to him and he takes Mary to be his wife, notice verse 25, and did not know her. As we've already seen, that's a euphemism for a sexual relationship. He did not know her. Will you circle the next word, till or until? She had brought forth her firstborn son. The whole Catholic doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary just got blown out of the water. You realize that Mary and Joseph later, after the birth of Jesus, have at least four sons and they have at least two daughters. No names are given for the daughters, but when it ends as a plural, daughters, it means you got more than one, right? So they have at least six children, four boys and uh, two daughters, and then you have Jesus that is born to Mary, but Joseph is not the father and it says that he did not know her. He did not have sexual relationship with her until, what is, what is Matthew doing? He's protecting the virgin conception of the son. Why? Because in Isaiah 7, 14, that fulfills the prophecy, doesn't it? Verse 23, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. In other words, the Christ child, the Messiah that's coming into this world is coming through the womb of the virgin. She was a virgin when they were betrothed. They had not come together as husband and wife, and even after he takes her to be his wife, he does not come together with his wife until... Jesus is born into this world because that fulfills the prophecy. That identifies the one who is being born here as the Messiah, the one that the Old Testament had long promised. And that was the result of a man who was a disciplined man. I, I, I don't understand the morals of our day and the lack of discipline that's so evident in our day when it comes to morality. He was a godly man. He was a patient man. He was a gracious man. He was a compliant man. He was a disciplined man. Can I tell you that he was a strong man? You say strong? Yeah, yeah. He was a carpenter. 
And I'm talking about that kind of strength, though. I'm sure, though, as a carpenter, he was a strong man. I mean, you're lifting lumber, and you're moving it from one place to another. You're hammering, and you're using the antiquated tools of that day. You know, they didn't have power tools. You understand, no power outlets to be able to plug them into. They had no way to do things except the old-fashioned way and work out in the sun, work out in the heat, work inside. There was no air conditioning inside. There were were no comforts like you and I think of. He no doubt was strong physically. I'm thinking more of this man who was strong emotionally and mentally. Because you know what he did when he took Mary to be his wife? All of the shame that was hers, he took it on himself. Do you realize that? Everything that would be said about her would now be said about him. Oh, yeah, yeah. He says it wasn't his child, but yeah, we know the truth. Yeah, that's why he married her. He wanted to cover up. They're just covering up what really happened. And all the shame that would be heaped on her would ultimately be heaped on him. He could have legally put her away, and he would have avoided any kind of monetary responsibility to her. He could have had her taken to the justices and had her taken outside the city and stoned to death, and he would have been free from any responsibility from any shame being brought on himself. But what does he do? He takes this woman, Mary, his betrothed wife, and he marries her. He goes through with the marriage ceremony, though he doesn't know her as a husband and wife would normally know one another. And he takes on himself all of the shame. Can you imagine how difficult that would be? Can you imagine how difficult that would be? You see, here's the problem we have, and the reason why you're having trouble identifying. We live in a law and justice society, a law and justice society. They lived in an honor and shame society. Honor was everything, and shame was to be avoided at all costs. And here was Joseph, not a law and justice society, but an honor and shame society. You can still find some of those societies in the Middle East even to this day honor and shame, was taking on himself the shame that would be heaped on Mary. And he was identifying himself. He was introducing himself right into the very middle of it. What would you think if your wife was looked at and stared at and spoken negatively about and talked about behind her back and people had things to say about her? How do you think you would feel? As a matter of fact, uh, turn over for a moment to Mark chapter 6. I think even... 30 plus years later, a lot of this is still going on. That shame that a lot of people pointed to her and directed to her was still going on. In Mark chapter 6, notice what it says. Uh, verse 2 And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man, where, where did this, uh, man get this, these things? And what wisdom is this? which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hand. Now listen to what they say about him. Is this not the carpenter? Is this not the carpenter? Notice, the son of who? Mary and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him, the son of Mary. You understand, that's not how you referred to a child that was born in that day. That's the son of Joseph. That's the son of Philip. That's the son of John. That's the son of Mark. You didn't say that's the son of Mary. Calling him the son of Mary may well have been what we think of as a curse word, Speaking of him as the illegitimate one. And yet when it came time, what did Joseph do? Spoken to by the angel, given direction from God himself about what he should do. And that the child that was, being con- or that was conceived in the womb of Mary was in fact a virgin conception. And that she had been chosen of the vessel through which the Christ would come into the world. What does he do? He steps right into the middle of that shame. And he takes it on himself. That's a strong man. He's a godly man, he's a patient man, he's a gracious man, he's a compliant man, he's a disciplined man, he's a strong man. But may I say, maybe most significantly, he's a blessed man. You realize that the only word 
that we have that Jesus, that, uh, jo- that uh, uh, Joseph speaks, the only word we have that Joseph speaks is at the end of verse 25. I mean, you read the rest of the Gospels for yourself. You'll find him mentioned 15 or so times, many times that it's referring to uh, his work uh, or he's the, uh, speaking of uh, someone, he's the son of Joseph. But 15 times or so you find his name mentioned. But, but, but notice, if you will, the only thing he says, and he, who is he? Joseph. He called his name Jesus. What a blessing. What a blessing. Do you understand what's taking place here? By calling him Jesus, he's adopting him into his family. Naming him was claiming him as his son. Did you hear that? Naming him is claiming him as his son. The only word we ever hear Joseph speak is the name of the son that is not his physical born son. And the name is Jesus. Because naming him in that society meant claiming him, meaning that he adopted him. Now, why is that important? Now, are you with me so far? Here's the reason why this is important, because the gospel of Matthew is concerned with one thing. It's concerned with proving that Jesus is the Messiah, the King of the Jews. And it's the reason when you read through the gospel of Matthew, you see Old Testament references and the New Testament fulfillment over and over again. Matthew wants to make sure that you understand that the one who was born through the Virgin Mary that that one who was born named Jesus is in fact the long-awaited Messiah, the one who has the right to be king over Israel. Because by being adopted to David, he becomes a part of the lineage. Being adopted by Joseph, he becomes a part of the lineage of David. But matter of fact, just back up in chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ the son of David. You get down to verse 6, and Jesse begot David the king. Who are we following here? We're making sure that from Abraham we follow a genealogy that takes us through David. And what happens when you get to the end of this genealogy? I mean, there's one son, that there's one father who begets another. Verse 3, Jacob begot Perez and Zerah. Uh, by, by Tamar, I should say. And Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Amenadab, and Amenadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Solomon. You, you see how it goes? But then you get over to verse 16, and Jacob begot Joseph, and it normally would say what? Who begot Jesus? But it doesn't say that, does it? Why? Notice. Jacob begot Joseph, Uh uh-oh, here's something completely different, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. He changes the pattern altogether. He comes through Mary. Well, how is he going to become the line of David, through the line of David? Because Joseph is going to call him his name, Jesus, and by calling him, he claims him and adopts him, and he brings him into, if you will, through David, through Joseph at least, brings him through the lineage of, of, of David. So that Jesus is the long-awaited one. Jesus is the legal, has the legal right to the throne of David. He has the legal right to the throne of David. By the way, I think it's interesting. There's five women mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. You have Tamar in verse 3. You have Rahab and Ruth in verse 5. You don't have her name, but you know who she is, the wife of Uriah. That's Bathsheba. All of those are irregular births, wouldn't you say? Three of those, at least, involve some form of immorality. They're irregular births that are unholy for the most part. But when you get to Mary, you have another irregular birth, but it's to a holy woman. And God is borrowing her womb, using her womb, this virgin conception It's not Joseph begot Jesus, it's Joseph 
gave Jesus the name. He called him Jesus. And by calling him that name, he was adopting him as his son, taking him as his son so that he would be a part of the lineage of David. What an incredible thought. You, you understand that at the birth of Jesus, Matthew records no trip to Bethlehem. There's no manger. There's no angels rejoicing. There's no shepherds looking for a baby in swaddling clothes. Because Matthew's purpose is this genealogy about the, the, about, uh, the birth of Jesus. This, his purpose in this genealogy and this birth story is to show how Jesus, who had no physical human father, can be the son of David. Matthew's goal is to prove that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah and King. And when Joseph named him, he was adopting him into the line of David. You understand? If you look back at verse 18 for a moment, it says, And his mother Mary, by physical birth, he was Mary's son. Betrothed by Jesus, by legal birth, he was Joseph's son. And by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, he is God's son. Do you see that? By Mary, he is phys the physical son. By Joseph, he's the legal son. By the Holy Spirit, he is God's son. I mean, this is a special one being born on that day. And Matthew is concerned with making sure you understand that Jesus has legal right to the throne of David, that he is in the line of David, that he is the Messiah, that he is the long-awaited one. He is the Savior of the world. He's a blessed man. But now I want to come back to Joseph for just another moment. And I want you to think with me practically. He's a godly man. He's a patient man. He's a gracious man, a compliant man, a dis disciplined man, a strong man, a blessed man. He gets to name him Jesus and by doing so, adopting him, claiming him as his son. But think for a moment what it was like for Joseph during those hours before he knew. Before the angel came and visited him. Before he understood that the baby that was being born to Mary, his betrothed wife. Think about the struggle, his internal struggle. Think about the mental arguments that were going on in his head. Think about how his heart was crushed beyond measure. Think about how disappointed he was. Think, think about how desperate he felt. Think about how down he was. Think about the difficulty that was facing him in trying to make a decision. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't want to take her out and have her stoned to death. And I, I don't want to give her any more shame. She's going to have enough of that to bear on her own. What am I going to do, God? My whole world was before me. I was looking forward to all of these things that we were going to share together. And now, Lord, look. It's a mess. Can I ask you a question? Do you ever feel like that sometimes in your world? You ever feel like that in your world? Just ignore them talking out there. Just listen to me. You ever, you ever feel like that? Maybe you're in a situation right now where your world has come apart. Maybe you're in a situation where your world is filled with disappointment and dissatisfaction and heartbreak and heartache. Things that you never, ever thought you would have to deal with, you're having to deal with at this moment. I mean, this is Christmas season. This is the time when we ought to be joyous. Don't feel a lot of it sometimes because we're so busy running from one place to another and spending money that we sometimes don't have. And you know all the joy and the cheer as we try to get to one thing that everybody else is trying to get to and trying to get there before they do so you're not left out. Or when the UPS truck drives by and it doesn't have your package today and it doesn't have it the next day and it doesn't have it the following day and then you get the email message and it says, ah, oh, it's going to be a few days before it gets there and what am I going to put in that gift? How are they going to know that this is a present for them? And Am I going to give them a printed out picture and say, well, this is coming? <laughs> you know, all those fun things about Christmas here it is, it's supposed to be the most exciting season of the year. All the lights and all the tinsel and all the trees. 
and your heart is literally coming apart at the seams. Maybe it's a loved one that has gone to heaven and you're wondering, how in the world am I ever going to get through this Christmas season? I don't want to celebrate. He or she's not at the table. All the fun we used to have preparing for the kids and the grandkids, it's gone. It's not there without him or her there. Maybe it's a divorce or maybe it's a reversal of job. Maybe it's a diagnosis. Maybe it's some other difficulty of your life. And Yeah, you're a godly person and you, you exhibit patience and you can be gracious and compliant and obedient to the Lord. As a matter of fact, you feel about yourself. Why? God, I've been a good person. I, I've tried to do what was right. I've tried to obey. I've tried to live my life in a way that honored you. I've tried to be the kind of person you would want me to be. I've tried to love you and love others. And God, all of these things I've tried to do, but look where I am, God. It's a horrible mess. And you're patiently waiting. Lord, what do I do? I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. God, please show me what to do. Anybody feel that way? Don't raise your hand. Anybody feel that way? Now, I want you to notice something about Joseph just as I finish here. I want you to notice that to a man who was struggling with something that you and I can't fully put ourselves in the middle of even when we try to understand it, we can't fully grasp it all. You may have been through some things that feel something like what he might be feeling, but you can't put yourself in the middle of his story and totally grasp all of the emotions, the depth of the emotions that he's, he's feeling. But I want you to notice something, that in the darkest moment of Joseph's life, when he, his life, when he thought his world had come apart and he didn't know what tomorrow would look like. I want you to notice that God came to him. God didn't abandon him. God didn't walk away from him. God didn't leave him. That God came to him. God came to him through the angel. God came to him. Do you realize that you may think God's not going to come to you, that somehow you're all alone, you got to figure this out on your own, and that isn't the truth, that isn't the truth? God's coming to you. God is there with you. He's promised never to leave you, and he's promised never to forsake you. And at this moment, you might not sense him or feel his nearness, but the reality is he's coming to you. He's coming to you. Here's a man who's brokenhearted. God never walks away from his children. And God wasn't about to walk away from Joseph or Mary for that matter. It wasn't about to walk away from either of them. And God came to Joseph. Well, you notice, secondly, that God strengthened him. God spoke to him, and God told him what was going on, and God clarified in his heart. Now, look, you're not going to get an angel likely that's going to come show up in your house and is going to tell you everything's going to be okay. And I want to give you what's going on and help to explain it to you. If you do, please call this preacher. I want to come see the angel. Or I'll just come be the angel. How about that? <laughs> you know how God's going to speak to you most likely? You're going to open up your Bible and you're going to read the scripture and you're going to spend time looking at what it has to say. You're not going to rush through it. You're going to be listening to the voice of God and you're going to find that God comes to you and through the pages of this book, God strengthens you. Do you realize that God not only came to Joseph and strengthened him, but God guided him. God showed him what to do and told him what to do next. And we should never move. We should be like Joseph, a patient man who waits on God. Don't make a move till you know what God wants you to do. God came and not only strengthened him, but guided him and said, Joseph, now this is the baby. She's telling you the truth. This is a virgin conception. She has not been with another man. She's not acted immorally. She doesn't need to be stoned to death. She, doesn't, she, she shouldn't be put away in divorce. She should be taken, and you're going to take her as your wife. And what does he do? He immediately does so because God gave him direction. And you're sitting at this season of the year, and you're wondering, what's next? 
Where do I go from here? I don't know what to do. And God is saying to you through Joseph that if you'll wait on me, I'll come and I'll show you. I've watched too many people make too many mistakes. Over, I've made too many mistakes over the course of my own life, acting on my own and not waiting on God and finding out what God wanted. And sometimes it won't cost you. It'll cost your children or it'll cost your family. Just because you did what you wanted to do the way you wanted to do it, and in the process you lose your kids, wait on God. Wait on God. Don't get ahead of God. He didn't know what to do. He was absolutely brokenhearted. His life had been turned upside down. Everything was a mess. He didn't know where to go from there. Would he even want to go back to work as a carpenter and do the job that he'd been doing all of his life? What's he working for? There's nobody going to meet him at the end of the day. What's he working for? And God comes to Joseph, and God strengthens him, and God guides him. But now listen, and he showed him his purpose for his life. God took what looked like an utter mess from Joseph's perspective and he turned it in to the most glorious birth that we're celebrating 2,000 years later. Do you get what I'm saying to you? God wants to come to you. God wants to strengthen you and he wants to guide you And he wants to show you your purpose through your circumstances. And what did it say? And he, Joseph, called his name Jesus. My purpose is to call him Jesus. And by naming him, I'm claiming him as my own and I'll be his stepfather and I'll raise him and I'll love him and I'll teach him and I'll be there for him I I still think one of the funniest stories is a little bit later when Jesus is about the age of 12 and they go to Jerusalem for one of the the feasts and they're leaving and they think that Jesus is in the crowd can you imagine going a, a, a considerable amount of distance away and realizing where's Jesus I mean would you want to be the parents that lost God It's still one of the funniest stories, and they go back, and they find him. He's sitting right in the middle of all these, uh, these esteemed scholars, and they're all bumfuddled. I mean, who is this kid that's teaching us? I mean, we can't understand. I mean, I've never met anybody this age that understands what he understands. But Joseph got it. He understood his purpose. By the way, apparently Joseph dies before Jesus enters his ministry. But he did what God intended him to do. He took his son to Egypt and protected him. He brought him back to Israel as God told him. He took him to Nazareth just like Jesus, just like God instructed him to do. He did all of those things in providing for him and making sure he knew what his purpose was. What are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm telling you. I don't know what's going on in your life this Christmas season, and I don't know what reversals. I I do know some of them. What reversals you're facing and what heartache and what pain you're going through. But I want to tell you, you couldn't have been any lower than Joseph was at this moment. And God came to him. And God strengthened him. And God guided him. And God showed him out of what seemed to be a mess what his purpose was. And Joseph got this incredible blessing to name Jesus and thus claim Jesus into the line of David. 